I think I spent uh, 25, 30 years in uh, struggle for a existence and uh, worked, worked for a living, worked in the software industry. Just lucky to have uh, been in the software industry at a time where uh, I could gather some capital and be in the situation of not having to work for a living. So having done that, I think it was important to do something which was diametrically opposite to being concerned with money. So something to do with passion. Then obviously the whole idea of farming came in. I come from an agricultural community which has been peasant farmers. So farming has been in my blood in that sense. When I was a child, uh, so my grandmother was very much in the village. She was a farmer. She had five acres of land and she was widowed at a very early age. So she managed this small five acre land holding, but she actually used to supervise the farming herself. So when I was a child, I used to go in the summer. Uh, you know, remember my father telling me very clearly that you will not understand anything about me if you don't see how my mother has worked so hard to get me to be a doctor, which is what he was. But it's uh, not with uh, just a sense of romance because I grew up in a very political environment where the politics of inequality were very, very important. So I was brought up in a very uh, aware environment of the inequalities of village life. But that doesn't take away from the romance of sitting next to my grandmother and having rotis and, uh, and saag cooked on a, on a chula where the uplas, you know, from cow dung. Uh, that's the fuel and you have the lakdi from the arhar and she's talking to you and she's feeding you with that love. So the inequalities of village life are something that I started to understand in my 20s. And that was actually one of the purposes of this journey of Aman Bagh. At Aman Bagh, we employ five people today. It's a combination of many things. So first, inequality of caste. The lady who cooks our food is from a Dalit community. She's landless. She lives in a mall, 150 square foot place. She's got two sons and a daughter. She's a widow. Her reality is that of that 30% of India's population who doesn't have any source of income from the soil. So here is this girl, she's a microcosm. The life of a landless woman who's a widow who's oppressed by society for thousands of years. So that's a learning. The second is that we've got four other men. They, they, they are meos from Mewat the Muslim community, who were indistinguishable from their Hindu brethren till perhaps a hundred years back. So through their lives, I understand rural Islam, which is very different from urban educated Urdu speaking Muslims. I see the world through their eyes of the discrimination they experience, of the impact of many things which are happening in Haryana, you know, for example, the ban on uh, cow slaughter and how it has created a sense of insecurity in the minds of many people in the community. All four of them have got land less than an acre. Seventy percent of India's population lives in the village, not all of them farm. Fifty percent farm. Eighty percent of that fifty percent owns less than two hectares of land. That means eighty percent of the farmers are either small or marginal. That means their life is just about at sustenance level. They've got land less than an acre. One has got, I think, one acre, one's got, two have got about half an acre or more, and one's got quarter of an acre. How do you make do with life like that? So this journey of, of understanding uh, rural India through the eyes of, of uh, the people who work for me was was completely fascinating and uh, there is that thing of the romance 
that the romance is for my childhood and my personal experiences with my immediate family in the village, which is very different from the reality of village life, which is obviously lurking behind that romance. And it's a very ruthless, very uh, exploitative, very unequal society. It was a nebulous idea to establish a model organic farm with my uh, partner and friend, Iskandar. I yet remember the first guy that Iski and I met. He told us this thing which we found so funny. You must have cattle, you must have cows. I said, but we don't, we're not really interested in milk. He said, no, no, it's not for the milk, it's for the dung. And that is the whole start of the journey of understanding the power of soil. The purpose of Aman Bag and of any farm which are which are traditional peasants know is to retain the health of the soil. That knowledge has been lost in chemical farming because now you're not focused on the health of the soil, you're focused on the output of your farm, which is the produce. In Haryana, in South Haryana especially, where we are in the middle of the Aravali range, the soil is very sandy. You know, there is 500 to 600 millimeters of rain a year, 80% of which falls within the monsoon, which is July and August. So the soil is very sandy. It's got 0.3% organic matter. The temperate regions of the world, including Indian Himalayas, the soil organic matter can be between 4 and 7%. And I think the biggest learning we've had is that the purpose of Aman Bagh is to build healthy soil. The whole organic ecosystem is as terrible as the commercial ecosystem. Can you take 400 acres of land, for example, farm it with unsustainable ways? For example, the first is fossil fuel based tractors. The amount of fossil fuel that it uses, the amount of pollution it causes, and then the whole life cycle maintenance of a machine which costs 8, 10, 12 lakhs. If you farm 400 acres of land using a tractor, is it sustainable? I have a pair of bullocks which cost in the market today 10 to 15,000 rupees. Zero maintenance except food. They don't fall sick, they are local from this area. 15 years, zero maintenance other than the food, and that's it. The second example I'll give is that if you're growing organic wheat using a tractor without chemicals, but you're growing 400 acres of wheat, is that sustainable? It's not. Nature is diverse. So to my mind, 400 acres of commercial organic farming for the market is almost as bad as 400 acres of commercial chemical farming for the market. Because you get part of that consumerist world. You're just consuming healthier. Now certainly having 400 acres of wheat uh, tilled by a tractor without chemicals is better than 400 acres of wheat tilled by a tractor and using chemicals. But it's tweedledee and tweedledum. You're not really changing anything. You're not standing up. You're not, you know, making a point. You're not resisting the, the status quo. We are trying to resist that. Now, five years after doing this, I think I have I put it together in some kind of a triangle the two bases of the triangle. The first base is the lifestyle, which is you want to be in a healthy environment. We planted 2,500 trees. We have uh, greened the area. We use uh, drip irrigation. We're conscious of water. We don't use fossil fuel. We don't have tractors. We have bullocks. We use gober gas. The second leg of that triangle is livelihood. What about the people who make their livelihoods from agriculture, 80% of whom have got less than 2 hectares? And 30% of India's population who lives in the village and who doesn't have any land. That's the issue of the inequality. That's the issue of understanding the many layers of inequality which exist in rural society. There is no romance in that. So the first piece, which is the lifestyle, if it's taken in isolation from livelihoods, then it becomes an urban phenomenon for the rich. 
you are just romanticizing the lifestyle. You are just talking about, you know, organic food, so there is an organic retailer. So you are divorcing food from society. Then you get, you know, this whole thing of consumption again. And that's the root of the problem that we are actually facing, that where does this consumption going to lead us? I think that is filled in by the third part of the triangle, which is love. And it comes from compassion, which means love for the soil. It means love for the people who are living off that soil. 